Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to call the Education Policy Committee to order. We have one bill on our agenda, Senate File 1311. There, well, I will uh, let you go, Senator Swazinski, uh, to move your bill. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. We do have an amendment. Go ahead. I'd like um, to introduce. All right, Senator Swazinski moves the A23 amendment. Uh, this is the first committee. This is, a, are you sure it's not 25? Okay. Uh, Senator Swazinski moves the A25 amendment. This Madam is, Chair. Uh, Senator Abler. Just before you rush through this one, I think there's going to be a lot of people celebrating all across the state with this amendment that I'm thinking it is. Is this the one that takes out the homeschools? Uh, Senator Swazinski. Um, it, it, well, it, um, yes, it takes out that portion of the bill. Yeah, so I just wanted to... Senator and a few Abler, other Senator Swazinski. <laughs> Members, Sorry. This is, a, this is an author's amendment, so I'm just going to... This, well, by Chair. custom and usage, we're, we usually just let those go through and get it in the order that the author would like it in. Yes, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Um, it is not always a custom and usage. It's becoming that, which is a bad custom. Um, and sometimes amendments are noteworthy enough to talk about. Sometimes you get a whole delete all at the author's table on the first bill and no one knows what it is. So it's a, it's a custom that could be not used correctly. This topic has been so concerning to so many people. I bet some people in the audience as well. And so calling attention to it will make them very happy. So I was thinking to ask for a roll call so we could all show our celebration of this, this amendment going forward because it's such a big deal. So, but I won't do that. But I, I think it's just worthy to note. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, I will continue the custom of this committee. Um, Senator Swazinski, would you like to say anything about your amendment? Do you have a copy of the amendment in front of you, Senator Abler? Just confirming that. Uh, I saw one before. It okay, okay. One. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry for the... All right, all those in favor of the A23 amendment, uh, say aye. 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 Those opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Swazinski, to your bill as amended. Now that it is in order, please... You may. Please begin. Well, I'm going to turn this over to the experts and um, with the Department of Education, and they'll go through the bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. And can both of you sign in um, at some point? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uni. Uh, begin when you're ready. Madam, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, thank you very much. My name is Adosha Uni, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. I think while we get our PowerPoint set up, I'd like to just quickly um, provide some overarching testimony on the bill, and then I can walk through the provisions, the highlight provisions of the of the amendment, the author's <laughs> amendment, just to make sure that everyone's clear in terms of what it's doing for the bill as uh, members and the public walk through the bill as we provide testimony and there's questions and uh, discussion later. To just start out, um, really appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony and present on the governor and lieutenant governor's 2023 education policy bill. And I want to thank Chair Swadzinski for carrying this important bill. We've got a lot of um, provisions in here that we've heard uh, over the years and happy to bring uh, many of them forward again. And this policy bill is predicated on the Due North Education Plan from the Governor and Lieutenant Governor and seeks to work toward the goal that every child receives a high quality education no matter their race or zip code. It focuses on centering our students in all that we do and builds Minnesota's world-class education through a safe and welcoming environment with caring and qualified teachers so that students as unique individuals are seen, valued, and heard as they come into our school buildings every day. You'll hear about embedding more inclusiveness and rigor into our academic standards to ensure that all students receive a high-quality education. Through our American Indian Education Package, we are looking to create a more supportive teaching and learning environment that not only enhances our American Indian students' learning, but supports families as well. Our students deserve to have the best chance to succeed in school, and that means having innovative and non-exclusionary approaches to keeping them where they are and when, uh, when they face behavioral challenges. Our students and schools, pardon me, thrive when we all have, when we are well, when we have well-supported and valued educators who are well-qualified. These are just some of the themes that you'll hear from us today. And joining me is my government relations colleague, Megan Ariola, 
And with that, I will for, I'll just further describe what was in the amendment um, for the for the committee and for the public, um, if, if that's quite all right. Um, the first portion on uh, of the amendment on line 1.2 uh, removes a proposal that we had in or we have in the bill that require unaccredited non-public schools, including homeschool uh, students. To, and families to submit annual assessment reports to their local district superintendent. Uh, after significant outreach from families and advocates, we determined the best approach was to pull back on the proposal for now and work in a more robust, collaborative fashion over the interim for solutions in this space. We believe all children deserve the best education and we can certainly get there together. Another portion clarifies that the proposal, I believe on, um, Line 1.6, another portion clarifies that the proposal closing the Tier 2 to Tier 3 pathway based on experience takes full effect in 2026. And then the majority of the language below that clarifies that online learning um, cannot be a forced option for education, care, and treatment day facilities. And then some of the other language in other spaces removes unintended language, corrects dates, and timelines. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'll just... Um, I'll move forward with my substantive testimony on the uh, on the uh, provisions in the bill. Um, thank you, Mr. Uni. I'm just going to pause really quickly. Members, we do have a senator that's joining us um, for the record. It's Senator Housechild from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Uni, please continue. If we can advance the side, please. I believe to slide two or three. If we can go one more, please. Thank you. So where I'll start my comments is with the academic standards in the bill. Um, first, we would like to embed the contributions and history of American Indians and tribal nations to all of our academic standards. It's critical that all, that all students are taught about this topic, and we've, heard, um, and we've heard in the legislature this session and before um, how much we as a society need to improve our knowledge in this space. And you'll hear more, I'll talk a little bit more later about indigenous education for all in a, on a later slide in the presentation. We're also seeking to embed ethnic studies into our academic standards in much the same manner. This will ensure that our students have the opportunity to learn about the contributions and histories of the diverse people we have in our state and country. We're, uh, next, we're seeking to make absolutely clear in statute that when standards come up for review and revision, that MDE has the authority to engage in rulemaking without seeking new authority in legislation. We believe that we currently have this authority, um, but we want to make absolutely sure that it's clear in statute. For mathematics and science, the majority of the confusion relates to tra the word traditional course or the phrase traditional course and so uh, that are named in, in statute. Um, and so the changes we're making here provide clarity uh, around satisfying the Minnesota academic standards. We are, uh, as you heard, uh, I believe in the prior week or the week before, we're seeking to delay the review and revision of the physical education standards to allow more time for educators to implement the current standards and to avoid confusion through the field on whether the current standards are needed to be implemented. The next portion is around, um, is around um, related to agricultural programming at schools. Um, this proposal uh, serves to clarify that agriculture includes food and natural resources pathways as well as within the license that MDE approves programs, not departments, and to correct an error in statute that points to an incorrect subpart of the rule. We are adding arts to the list of required statewide or making clear that arts um, is a statewide standard right now in statute. It says local or statewide stand or local or state standards, making clear that it's state and then we're adding media arts to the statute as an arts credit option. Currently, there is a single line in Minnesota statute which directs each school district to establish its own standards in career and technical education. This language provides a little guidance about the rigor or alignment of those standards. Additionally, this language is silent on how frequently the standards should be reviewed and updated. So this proposal will provide clarity to local districts, charters by listing resources that they should reference while establishing their own standards in career and technical education. These listed resources will ensure the CTE program standards address current workforce needs and increase student career and college readiness. And finally, for our academic standards and assessments, we're recommending that we reduce unnecessary student testing by eliminating questions, uh, by eliminating off-grade questions on the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessments. Next slide, please. 
for the online learning proposal, the current online learning act statute has been updated in kind of a piecemeal fashion over the years. And the statute seems to be a little bit messy and confusing and not really accessible to our partners in the field. So we're going to be first doing a full repeal and replace of the current language. And the new online instruction act will be more streamlined to read. It's current with the technology needs and potential that 2023 offers us and reflects the feedback MDE um, has received over the past, frankly, the past 10 years. Um, learners, families, and schools are seeking increased flexibility um, to enable personalized learning approaches, and the current legislation restricts schools from offering online course, uh, courses unless they become a state-approved online provider. And so this proposal would allow all districts and schools to become on providers of online learning uh, without an approval process. This is a learning modality. They would still retain the approval process for districts and charters who want to be supplemental online learning providers. That means that they're <coughs> providing online instruction to students that are not their open enrolled or resident enrolled uh, students. They would be people, they would be students who are attending their online uh, courses only and not resident or open enrolled students. The next proposal is on residential treatment also related uh, to, to uh, the component also related to online learning. This proposal is to clarify that school districts responsible for education programs and day and residential care and treatment facilities may utilize state approved online learning programs in the home school districts and charter schools of students in fulfilling their responsibilities for educational programs and services in those facilities. Um, we have heard that uh, from from districts and charters that if they were allowed to use online learning to meet their commitments to the kids in um, in these care and treatment facilities, um, that this would provide a big benefit for the first more the first of all the students and the families, but also the districts, and um, this would um, this would provide relief um, going forward. So allowing students this avenue for their education enable, has enabled students in the places where it has been used to maintain a connection with their home district, track completed coursework and credits more easily with their home district, and potentially support better transition of students back to the home district after their care and treatment programming. Next slide, please. Moving on to the next, issue, next uh, topic area, mm -hmm. American Indian education. These are proposals that the department has brought um, several times over the years. Uh, Senator, uh, Chair Kunish has brought several of these proposals as well. We appreciate her leadership in this space. Um, this bill includes a robust package of policy changes intended to support American Indian students, recognize their unique, uh, their unique identities and needs in the space of education, and enhance clarity on existing provisions related to American Indian education aid and programming. The first proposal on this slide is related to sacred tobacco. Uh, we know that um, our American Indian students, um, or, I'm sorry, uh, our American Indian communities have used traditional tobacco for centuries for ceremonial, religious, and healing purposes. This bill explicitly adds a permission, uh, permission for American Indian students to carry a medicine pouch containing loose tobacco as part of a traditional spiritual or cultural practice without fear of, um, of discipline on a school campus. Next slide, or I'm sorry, not next slide, sorry, the next proposal. Um, this proposal makes it clear that American Indian students may wear items of cultural and religious significance at graduation ceremonies. Items such as an eagle feather are recognition for a significant contribution to the community and is also a sign of academic success. Um, normally, this is not a, a problem for in most districts and, and charters during graduation ceremonies, but every year we do hear in the community and at the department um, issues where a student is prohibited from wearing this object of cultural significance. And uh, we generally have to either do direct outreach to the districts or send a letter out um, clarifying this. Um, all of our American Indian students and families should be able to engage in their graduation ceremonies without having concern of whether this they will be permitted or not, whether it's um, all of our students or one of our students. So providing this clarity in statute will not only provide clarity for our students and families, but also provide clarity for districts and charters that this is an, a, a, pr a practice that students and families should be able to engage in during their graduation ceremonies. And then last on this slide is a proposed change on how Minnesota schools handle uh, mascots. Um, and we know that um, 
not all mascots um, honor American Indian people um, that depict uh, American Indians, and the caricatures and stereotypes of American Indian mascots can be harmful and perpetuate negative stereotypes. This bill would prohibit a public school or dis uh, district or charter from adopting a name, symbol, or image of an American Indian tribe, custom, or tradition as a mascot, nickname, logo, letterhead, or team name. And it also, the proposal also provides a process for seeking an exemption to the prohibition. Uh, if the community feels that the mascot is not derogatory or harmful, that process would engage the 11 tribal nations in Minnesota and the Tribal Nations Education Committee to seek that exemption. Next slide, please. First proposal on this slide adds provisions around the development and implementation for indigenous education for all, which I had mentioned earlier. Specifically, it strengthens and clarifies language on what is embedded in the academic standards related to indigenous education and how feedback is received. The bill language also provides a definition of what um, an indigenous education for all program should look like and accomplish, including a report to the legislature on a needs assessment to inform the development and future resources, or pardon me, development of future resources. Uh, on the next proposal, the bill would also add the Tribal Nations Education Committee, or TNEC, and Minnesota's Tribal Nations to the list of representatives the commissioner is required to consult with during the academic standards revision process. This is already occurring, but it would make it formal and ensure consistency going forward regardless of the revision process. And then last on this slide is requiring that a district or a charter school that receives American Indian education aid and serves more than 100 state-identified American Indian students provides American Indian culture and language classes with a portion of that American Indian education funding. Next slide, please. The bill also proposes a revision to the community coordinator statute we have for American Indian students. Districts in the state with 100 or more state identified American Indian students um, are required under statute to have a community coordinator. Um, this language change, uh, this language will uh, seek to ensure the full or part-time position is dedicated to American Indian education programming specifically or explicitly versus being an add-on or additional duty to an, uh, to an employee's uh, main job duties. The next provision is some cleanup changes to clarify that the state identified definition of American Indian student is used for uh, education statutes. This ensures that American Indian students who identify as more than one race are properly identified as American Indian, uh, as American Indian students, which the federal count does not do. And then last on this slide are minor clarifications to the role of the American Indian Education Director at MDE, who is established in statute. Next slide, please. First on the slide are a range of changes to the American Indian Parent Advisory Committees, or APAC, in terms of how they function and who participates. Districts or schools receiving American Indian education aid are required to have parent advisory committees to guide district decisions on how to invest those funds and support American Indian students. And the changes in the bill would make sure that the members are the parents or guardians of American Indian children, clarify that the state definition is used for the purposes of determining when a committee must exist, and provide a purpose for committees to review program, sorry, provide a process for committees to review program offerings extended to American Indian students. And then finally, the bill would make it clear that educational data may be disclosed to tribal nations about tribally enrolled or descendant students. And just to dive a little bit deeper into this, this would, all, this would be explicit uh, addition of tribal nations to a current data, educational data statute in Chapter 13 uh, that explicitly names 17 uses or entities that a district may share private educational data with. We currently believe that tribal nations are, well, the department does, are allowed under the statute. Some uh, legal representation for districts or charters believes that since tribal nations aren't explicitly listed on here, that at times they cannot uh, be shared, the data cannot be shared with them. Many of the districts who have tribal consultation duties um, are, uh, do share this data, but there are some that from a conservative interpretation of the statute feel that they are not able to, so this statute would 
um, explicitly allow districts to share that um, the educational data that the department doesn't necessarily have, like daily attendance data um, with tribal nations for the education, improved educational outcome for their tribally enrolled or descendant students. And with that, that uh, concludes my portion of the um, of presentation. Ms. Ariola, please, or Ariola, please uh, introduce yourself and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Megan Ariola. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the legislative coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, I will be taking over starting on this slide with alternatives to exclusionary discipline. We've heard many times in this committee about how exclusionary discipline policies are ineffective in creating a safe and equitable learning environment for all kids. Dismissing a student from the learning environment can and often does cause harm that has far-reaching negative implications for that student. During periods of suspension and expulsion, students miss important instructional time, and that puts the student at risk of decreased academic confidence and a decreased desire to increase their academic performance. To start off our package, um, the practice of suspending our youngest learners is a major contributor of discipline disparities and it starts very early. Eliminating the majority of suspensions for pre-K through third grade learners will help us significantly reduce these disparities. And I did just wanna add for the record that we do of course recognize that there are times when removal may be necessary. There's some, there are situations where a separation is in the best interest of everybody involved and that can also give everyone time, both adults and the students, to regulate their emotions emotions and come together, but it's essential that during that time the school must be partnering with the family and the student to make sure that the student's educational experience has minimal interruptions. MDE has been willing to work with parties in the past to ensure that this proposal gives appropriate flexibility and protects principal decision making and in addressing serious safety threats without using exclusionary discipline for subjective behavior concerns. So some of the portions of our package, I won't read through the whole slideshow, but much of this has been familiar and in the governor's package in the past, including statutory definitions of non-exclusionary discipline, pupil withdrawal agreements, and prohibition on um, the use of exclusionary practices for attendance and truancy issues, to name a few. Um, next slide, please. Next up, we have some provisions around early childhood and early learning. Um, all, making some of these adjustments to the uh, timelines by which families have to abide in order to um, to select an early learning scholarship or to uh, select another scholarship program, reducing that timeline to make sure that all families have appropriate and equitable access to these programs, um, making some preference opportunities available for open enrollment for uh, children in kindergarten who receive preschool services in the same district, adding some eligibility requirements to the early learning service, early learning scholarship statutes and also some prioritization categories, including um, children referred to or currently in need of protective service, child protective services and children of incarcerated parents. Um, finally, we are looking to make optional the in-person early childhood screening if the parent or child has um, immunocompromised health status or other concerns. Um, the, we found that during the pandemic and during the Safe Learning Plan, families were able to complete the screening virtually and districts and early learning providers have asked us for that continued flexibility. Next slide. We have all heard a lot about the the environment that teachers are working in, the demand on their time, and the shortage areas that we are currently suffering under, and we want to make sure that we are addressing that both with policy and budget proposals. So as we've spoken in committee before, um, the state goal to increase the teachers of color and American Indian teachers by 2% each year by 2040 is something that the department supports and is um, has provided supportive comments on before. As part of MDE's public engagement process, we hear time and time again from our com communities that students need educators who reflect the diversity of our state in order to thrive in their educational experience. Providing students with varieties of life experience, personal connection, learning styles, geographic origins, and cultural diversity at the head of their class helps them develop their own best learning styles and also supports the development of their aspirations and their future goals. We are also uh, looking to include revisions to the requirements on the world's best workforce and achievement and integration strategic plans conducted at the district level. The provisions added to the statutory requirements reflect what we've heard from our school communities that districts and schools need to look at cultural responsiveness and equity not as an afterthought but as a conscious conversation during the formulation of these strategic plans. 
And finally, um, re by requiring assessment of both teacher and principal progress toward cultural responsiveness as part of their regular evaluations, we affirm again that these are important aspects of the school experience for not only students, but the teachers and the staff in the school as well. Next slide. Uh, as more and more teachers have reported feeling vulnerable and um, struggling to teach a well-rounded and accurate account of their subject area for fear of disciplinary action, the provision barring retaliation would just provide statutory protections for teachers who are providing instruction that involves the contributions of federally protected classes of people. By removing the tier two pathway um, as a pathway to tier three, Currently, an educator with a Tier 2 license can use three years of Tier 2 experience if they haven't been placed on an improvement plan as a qualification to earn a Tier 3 license. With the amendment that was just adopted today, this bill does contain a grandfather clause that would allow all those who have, who have a Tier 2 license prior to July 1st of 2023 to use their Tier 3, Tier 2 experience, excuse me, to acquire a Tier 3 license no later than June 30th of 2026. Um, we feel that this is in response to some of the concerns that we heard about current tier two licensed teachers who are exploring this pathway and we want to make sure that they get the credit for the option that was available to them when they first received their license. Next, um, we are looking to eliminate the uh, basic skills exams for teachers for tier three and four teachers. Um, MDE sees this as a way to retain our tier three and four teachers by removing a barrier to licensure that we have heard has dissuaded candidates from applying for that license in the past. We have two provisions removing prohibitions on um, educators joining collective bargaining units and receiving continuing contract rights if they are a tier one teacher or if they are a community educator or early childhood or family educator. Um, this, by removing this prohibition, um, we allow our, our educators to access fair representation in the workplace if they so choose to be a part of that union. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding charter schools, over the past few years we have added in our policy bill, and we will be carrying it again, um, a market need and demand study set in statute as an expectations for certain aspects of the charter application process. Minnesota charter schools are public schools, and as such, MDE wants them to succeed, and we want them to serve the populations that need them. By requiring a market need and demand study as part of the application for new charter schools and new charter authorizers, um, which we all know is a common practice in other fields, we can ensure that newly opened charter schools are thriving, successful, and are staying around for as long as their students and families need them to be. As I said before, charter schools are public schools in Minnesota, and by providing an affirmative statement in statute that requires charter school admission be free to Minnesota students, and that Minnesota students receive um, priority for admission over out-of-state students, we provide statutory clarity and assurance that these educational options are part of uh, Minnesota's public education system. Uh, next slide. Amending some authorizer withdrawal requirements, lack of clarity in statute has led to some um, confusion between authorizers and MDE's interpretation about when the term of an authorizer ends. Um, adding this language makes it clear in statute that authorizer terms are active until either the authorizer withdraws from the position or the commissioner terminates the contract. Requiring a charter school to lease space from the owner of the space instead of subleasing it and prohibiting an affiliated building corporation from supporting more than one charter school at a time um, goes to the aforementioned goal of ensuring that these charter schools are thriving, successful, and staying around for as long as they are needed and just making sure that they get the attention that they deserve from the building owners and um, operators who are in charge of their physical surroundings. Next slide. Finally, we have some um, accountability and additional measures to add to our federal food service program administration. Um, we are looking to add in requirements regarding um, financial eligibility documentation to be part of the application to MDE, lim uh, li placing a limit on how often legally distinct sites can transfer their sponsoring organization to once per year, and there are some extenuating circumstances that may allow for that to happen more than once per year. Um, requiring a non-governmental organization to provide documentation to the department that their staff have completed program-specific training, which is provided by MDE before they are a sponsor of a, CK, of a CACFP or an SFSP site. 
Um, most of the time that our nutrition staff spent administering these programs was actually spent answering questions that are covered in these trainings. So to make sure that our staff time is being used effectively and that the uh, sponsors have all the information that they need before they get started providing these meals um, is a good use of our time. Finally, prohibiting new summer food service program locations from opening within an existing half or within a half mile of an existing site with a few caveats about if they're going to be serving a distinct kind of food or menu that is not offered at the other place or if there's a significant geographic barrier that would prevent access to the other locations such as a highway or a body of water. And I believe that is our last slide and we are available for questions. Members, question. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Swidinski, I don't know if this question is more for you or for Adosh. Uh, I appreciate you taking that homeschool provision out, but I'm wondering where that came from and why that was there in the first place. Uh, Ms. Ms. Ariola. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Um, we received in um, some outreach for the past, I believe, five years from our county social workers and county prosecutors who work in family law. Uh, they raised the issue to us looking for, looking to the North Dakota model that provides for the same sort of reporting requirements. So that was how the issue was raised to MDE, uh, and it would only have applied to unaccredited homeschools because we, un unaccredited non-public schools, excuse me, um, because the requirements for non-accredited versus accredited homeschools are different, and we wanted to provide some statutory clarity about um, reporting expectations on that lens. However, I can say that I've spoken to the advocates um, that are in the audience and that brought the issue to us to begin with, and we are really excited to bring all these folks to the table to talk about this, because after hearing from the outreach um, from the homeschool advocates and from the county social workers, we really do feel like there's a good common ground that we can come to with some dedicated conversation this summer. Senator Coleman. Thank you for that explanation for meeting with the homeschool advocates, and thank you, Senator, for being willing to to think on things and, and take that out. I think I shared with you that I just began my journey of homeschooling my boys this year and uh, have been so impressed with the advocacy I've seen from the homeschool community on this issue. I think there was a, a message sent very loud and clear and that message is back off. And I encourage the homeschool community to keep a close eye on this committee and to flag for us loudly again if there are things here that you don't like to see. Uh, we will continue to hopefully listen and work with the homeschool community to make sure the state stays a great state for homeschoolers. And uh, Senator Swidinski, in, in a year that I see Republicans reaching out across the aisle, that hand getting slapped away, I have to thank you for rising above that and being willing to work with us. That really gives me hope for the work that we're doing here. Uh, members, please, you can clap like this. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Abler. Never thought of doing the sign language clap. That's pretty good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have many questions, and I'll, I have a few comments, and uh, a few of my comments, and I'll yield to somebody else. And I do have an amendment along the way that I'm going to be offering, so just so you know. Um, and so, uh, Senator Suzinski, Madam Chair, Senator Suzinski, we have not had a chance to go through this bill. I told you I had some concerns. There are many. Um, and um, I'll try to cover as many as I can today. I wish we had a testimony press. I'll be offered at a later time. Some of the people who would be offering testimony would say what I'm going to say. Um, but I just, in terms of as I read the whole bill, uh, to the two uh, department people and the new commissioner who I wish could have come today so I could have told this to his face, I really like him a lot. I think he brings a lot to the table with his practical connection to the superintendent world and how it actually has to work. I don't see a lot of that in this bill. Um, what I'm worried about that we haven't spent any time on the committee yet is an example of a kindergartner who started school during COVID who did online and then online and now doesn't know how to read as a second grader. Um, and as they go back to school, I'm told that some teachers don't want to do hall duty because the students have forgotten how to not hurt them. Um, and I don't see any of that in here. And as I read headlines that say half the US students have lost ground in COVID, um, and my own family included, um, I think it's a duty of us to get after that. 
And that's what you're getting from me. Um, and I, that's my preamble. Well, and you said we can talk about that someday, and I'm looking forward, to Senator Swazinski, to a discussion about that, hearing from MDE, how are the test scores actually going? I met with my district, and they said, well, we're above the state average. Well, the state average was here, and then it dipped down just because of the interruptions. And I'm not blaming anybody. This is not a political statement. But like, you lose a year or two of, of your schooling in the first couple of years. It's really hard to catch up. And there's not enough support staff, et cetera. So anyway, and I want to thank you for taking out the homeschool thing. And to the department and to your commissioner who's not here, leave them alone. We homeschooled for five or six years. They are very committed uh, to their work. If you did get the test scores, it would not be productive in your marketing um, for how good we're doing as a state. And I'm committed to every student. 80% of the students at the end of the day are going to go to one of our schools. Um, and or more, and so we have a duty to help them succeed on an equal opportunity basis. Anyway, so that's, and so the homeschoolers, welcome to government. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Look where you started, Madam Chair. And so you get to experience government, and so this could be a homeschool unit itself. So, um, and so I, I'll just start going through the bill and do a number of questions, um, and then, uh, I'll, at some point, I'll just stop and let somebody else go, and then she can come back. And so, um, whichever one of you on page four, um, on line 4.2, it talks about that we're having, I'm a little, little out of touch on some of these things, but you add arts as a state standard. Is that new and is that controversial? Mr. Uni or whoever? Uh, Mr. Uni? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, no, that's not new. I mean, if you read the language. I mean, was it expected? Is that, Senator Is anybody Abler. surprised? That's what I meant. Yeah, no, no. Mr. Rooney. Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, my apologies. Um, uh, no, this is, this is not new. This is based on our uh, engagement with the arts teacher and in the field. All right. um, and, uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator, Senator Abler, I, if you'll just indulge me just a second, just to, I think it'll be helpful for the committee in terms of um, some of the concerns I think you laid out around um, some of the focus in the bill, maybe what you're not seeing here. I think we're really excited to talk about what's in the governor's budget bill that's focused on um, core academic subjects like reading and, or literacy and math instruction and then as well as supporting the needs of our students in terms of some of maybe their social, emotional, and behavioral needs as well um, with our bold literacy plan on the academic side and then our MTSS model on that side. So while it may not be embedded in the policy bill to the level I think you, you're, you're asking to see, I think you'll be excited about what you'll see in the, in the budget bill. Well, thanks. Senator Abler. And, I, and I, I understand I'm not high in the list of people you have to chat with. You've got a lead and you've got a chair. And but you know, a meeting about this bill might have been productive and you might have spared yourself some questions. But I think that some of the concerns I have would be concerns anyway. Uh, on, line, on page five, uh, line 5.5 to seven, where it says the commissioner may not append, amend these rules without legislative authorization. To me, it seems pretty clear that the legislature was supposed to engage on that. As a person who's been sitting through discussion of standards from the profile of learning to whatever you call the current thing, uh, this is, not technical to me. I'll just offer that as a comment. You can answer to everything, but it may be in practice, but it just seemed pretty clear language to me that you don't want to take that out. Manager. Uh, Mr. Ernie. Uh, Senator Abler, you know, our opinion is, is that we've been given the task in statute to review and revise all the standards on a rolling basis every 10 years. And so that directive that we have to review and revise and engage in rulemaking is in itself explicit direction that we have the ongoing rulemaking authority in this space only, not pervasive right. rulemaking authority. And so we wanted to make it absolutely sure, absolutely clear that we do have that rulemaking authority because you've already been given the, given the directive. Thanks. Senator Abel. Madam Chair, believe it or not, I'm actually going to skip some of my questions, but I, I, does, I probably have just a bunch. Um, on the same page uh, where it changes the science and math standards, it seems like that's lowering the bar. Uh, and I think math is so important you should raise it. Can you tell me that that's not lowering the bar? Mr. Uni. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abler, no, this is a, these changes are going to be aligning with the standards revision that we engaged in in math um, and in science. So it's just aligning where we are with the credits, with where the standards are putting, where the standards have to be taught. And so you know, algebra, algebra two is something that was moved into the eighth grade, eighth grade space 
and we are seeking clarification in the science um, in the science uh, statutes to align with the expectation of um, the expectation that the credits meet what the standards require, and so we believe that the language that we have there provides more clarity uh, for districts to meet that. Thank Senator you. Abler. I, I do appreciate that, and I, you changed some schedules in here, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes there's a couple of them. You go from 45 days to 10 days, which seems like a, like that doesn't seem fair to people that are trying to change their school. Um, you change the, when you have to announce the tests that are being offered from the first day of school, before the first day of school on page 14 to uh, at least by October. Uh, I mean, are there parents who are going to be like wishing they would have had more notice or is that just something minor that you're doing? Uh, Ms. Ariola. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. So this request, um, I'm going to start with the uh, testing calendar just to start because I have that page open right now. Um, this was a request from the districts because the original requirement for when they had to post their testing calendar was before the first day of the school year. And I think that anyone who has worked in a school at the beginning of the school year will tell you that testing calendars are kind of the last thing on right. their mind. So by offering this flexibility to give them at least until October 1st. Yeah, that's good enough. Yep. Senator okay. <laughs> I don't need long answers. I just, Great. Um, but I think a lot of people might have questions if they read this thing. Um, and then Madam Chair, on, uh, on just a couple more and then I'll take a little break. Um, maybe I'll offer my amendment before I go. Um, so the 18, uh, page 18 about this non-resident thing. Um, tell me, it seems like uh, on line 18.19 that going, I'm just going through the book, there's, these are not in order of priority, they're just like sequentially going through the bill for you. Um, on line 18.19, they have 45 days, but suddenly they only have 10. And that seems like that would be hard on a parent if they didn't really know what they wanted to do. If you're changing and it didn't go well or something, can you tell me why that's even that, why that's neutral and not bad for a family? Ms. Ariola. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Um, I also want to point out for the committee that we did provide in the amendment additional clarity on this line to make sure that that's clear that it's 10 business days. Currently with the 45 days, there was some question about when that starts and ends, if that includes weekends and holidays, and especially in alignment with the March 1st deadline. We heard that that was a, having to give that notice within 45 days didn't necessarily meet the needs of the families. It's like students take time to get used to a new school and get used to new teachers and new styles of learning. So by requiring them to have reporting on that withdrawal from 45 days from March 1st, or by March 1st or within 45 days of the new enrollment, um, that, that timeline was just too much time and not too much time to have in advance and not enough time to really get under them whether this school was a good fit or not. So the 10 business days is more in alignment with when we receive these notifications from parents and families about the new enrollment. Um, so it's, kind of, it's the practice that we're seeing as common. Well, thanks, and the reason I, Madam Chair, the reason I, it, we should take this offline, and I don't, I don't mean to burden the committee with time on these complicated things, but if the goal is to have families engage with the school have the students stay in a school, particularly the ones who are at risk for not staying in school, their lives are not very organized in some cases. And, as, and some of the people that are most at risk to not succeed are mobile. Uh, and they're, if they can stay in the same school all year long, it's a success for some of those families. And, and so you just don't want to have them give up and, and be done. And so I see this as a potential thing that could cause harm to the goals we all have. And I, I think that I'm pretty squirrely in the middle of all the goals that we have. Um, so we can take that offline. And you might find a better way to just make sure you don't exclude somebody who's honestly trying to make it work. And in my profession, I see all kinds of people with challenges in my, my clinic. And it's, they're just happy to make the day work. Uh, and you add the complications of trying to find out what school and now what, and maybe we can get this one, or, and you get rejected, and like, what is that? And they don't understand it, they don't have an advocate, so that's my concern there. Um, something that's a big star, Madam Chair, um, is uh, section 16 on page 19. And Mr. Uni, I talked to you about this. Uh, this would simply say that you, uh, you can't go to Bethel as an open enrolled student um, where they have 1,700 open enrollments, and it's ironic, I mean Northwestern, excuse me, or Bethel, or some other ones, because they have this 
statement of faith, and I don't understand why you would do this. Um, already, it's, it's working great. And, and again, <laughs> this is interesting, um, but, and, and, and I'll let you reply, but if you're trying to get students to stay interested in school, sometimes the very best thing is to give them a college experience that they'll be drawn into college through a successful encounter at one of these schools, and maybe in the neighborhood or, or whatever, and to make, a, in, in many cases, the very targets you're talking about, the BIPOC, tribal, low-income, whoever that you're trying to get to go through who historically have not been as successful. And this is just a bad idea. I'll let you reply, and then I have an amendment to take it out. So, Mr. Oney. Madam, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I appreciate the opportunity to, to clarify this section. So just from a higher level, the, this proposal applies to the admissions process for secondary students, so students in, right. in high school, to be able to attend post-secondary institutions, whether it be online or on campus, through the state-funded post-secondary enrollment option. So the intent of this proposal, since it's in the statute that directly relates to PSEO, is not to have any impact on the post-secondary student's application process or experience. It's purely for K through 12 public school students who are using a public school funded program to access these, these programs. What it would do is say that student or that institutions that receive this funding for the students to participate in this program could not have a faith-based admissions test. Currently, they're not allowed to have uh, courses that are faith-based. They can have a course that does a survey of a religion or talks about a religion, but cannot be delivered through a lens of a particular religious viewpoint. That's already clear in statute. But what we don't have clear in statute right now is, um, or what we're seeking to do with this, is to say that an admission into the program can't be based on a partic one's particular faith if you're using state dollars to pay for that experience. Um, so it would not have any impact on the the other the second the post secondary students there it would not have an impact on the faith based um, programming that the that the uh, post secondary institutions already offer. It's purely based on it would purely be a prohibition on a faith based application process process for the secondary students to engage in PSEO courses in Thanks, um, at Chair. these institutions. Uh, Senator Abler. Let me just make a motion to delete section 16, and then we can talk about it. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Abler, please repeat that for me. Oh, I'll move to delete section 16 on page 19. Uh, Senator Abler, is this an oral amendment or is this a, an amendment you've authored? It's oral. Oral amendment, okay. Uh, Senator, simple. Uh, Senator Abler, you are moving to amend uh, the bill as amended to delete section 16. So lines 19.1 through lines 19.17. Did I get that accurately? That's correct, thank you. Then I'll let people talk. I'm, I'm done for now. Okay. Um, to the amendment, Senator Swazinski. I would um, vote no on the amendment. Um, Article 13, Section 2 of the Minnesota State Constitution prohibits sectarian aid to public school or private school, sectarian schools. So I, I would say that this um, amendment violates the Minnesota State Constitution. Again, Article 13, Section 2. Um, explicitly prohibits st um, state monies going to sectarian institutions. So that'd be my two cents. Uh, to the amendment members, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have here in front of me um, case law that says what you just stated is incorrect from what I'm reading. The U.S. Supreme Court has again sided with religious institution case involving the First Amendment um, in, Kate, in Carson versus Macon, the Supreme Court held that a state refusing to allow children to use a taxpayer-funded tuition assistance program to attend a private religious school violated the free exercise <clears throat> of rights. So I feel like we are violating First Amendment of these children. Now, if they want to go to, a, it sounds like you're against Christianity, so that's not okay. Uh, now you're violating people's First Amendment rights in the Constitution. We need to stand up for the Constitution here in North America, in the United States, and Minnesota, and in this building. Um, this is not okay. This needs to be taken out, and what you're doing is wrong, and we all want to work together, but what you're doing is attacking people. We need to stop doing that. Uh, uh, Senator Swazinski or Mr. Uni, does this, the way that it's written right now, does it prevent people from attending religious institutions that align with their faith? 
Uh, Madam Chair, no, it does not. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Um, uh, Senator Duckworth, then Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Senator Abler, for raising this point. I had this uh, flagged as an area to ask a question about later, but um, it was going to be whether or not this bill has any implications for PSEO students, because I received a lot of outreach with people concerned that it was going to limit or affect their ability for their students to uh, utilize PSEO programs. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, the PSEO is a, it's a phenomenal program that the state allows for and works with local districts to allow students to attend courses at sometimes community colleges or other institutions of higher education, and they can receive credit and actually get a head start on, on their college education. Um, and I had highlighted the portion that an eligible institution must not require a faith statement during the application process. And my question was, was going to be pretty simple. What's, what's behind this addition to the language? What are we actually trying to stop or prevent here? Um, and has this been made an issue before? Has this been raised in the court? Um, why would we limit the ability of students to have the maximum amount of options available to them regarding their education while they're in high school and beyond, I guess, is the question. Um, Senator Susan Skier, Mr. Oney. Madam Chair, I, I think, and this goes to the Chair's uh, uh, question earlier, the, I think on, on the page as well as the intent, um, it does not limit a student's choice. What it does do is prohibit an institution from limiting the students that can access their programs based on, in this case, the discussion is based on the religion, but it's also based on a student's race, creed, ethnicity, disability, gender, sexual orientation. In this program, that's a state-based state -based program. Um, the student would still be able to attend this institution. It's about their admissions process. Um, the, this was raised, this issue, this is a provision that the department has carried for several years. Um, we, this issue was first raised to us several years ago about some post-secondary institutions that do have faith-based um, faith admissions process in the interview portion as well as the written portion. And the feedback that we got was that a student's response qualitatively on any of those portions of the admissions process would have a bearing on whether they were admitted into the PSEO program on campus. So this was seen as a barrier that an institution would have for a student's access to uh, these programs. And so this policy would remove that barrier of access that students have to these PSEO opportunities. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief follow-up. That seems to make a little bit more sense. Uh, when I read the sentence, um, if it were to say something to the effect of an eligible institution uh, must not base any part of the admission decision on a student's race, creed, ethnicity, disability, gender, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, or affirmations. That, to me, would seem to make sense and kind of in keeping with how we operate here within the state and in our country in general. I guess the, the part that is confusing folks, especially myself, is uh, the part that is specific as it pertains to requiring a faith statement. Uh, so I agree with what you're trying to explain, that we don't want to preclude students from being able to seek education at these institutions. Unfortunately, I think the way this is written kind of leads people to believe maybe it's having the opposite intent or potentially would. So um, that's just some feedback for you as it relates to this. And I can see why uh, Senator Abler and others, um, why they maybe flagged this portion of the bill and are seeking some clarity or some changes here. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Senator Wiesenberg, but I'm actually going to go to myself first because I'm jeering. Um, Mr. Uni, so I, I attended the University of St. Thomas, which is a Catholic institution. I'm Lutheran. Um, I'm going to give an example, and I want you to tell me if this fits into it or not. Um, if I wanted to attend PSEO from Eastview High School, where I graduated, at the University of St. Thomas, and part of their application process was, do you believe in transubstantiation, which is when you take communion and it becomes the literal body and blood of Christ, which my faith does not believe, but the Catholic faith does. And then my answer to that might influence whether or not I got into the PSEO program as an Eastview student at St. Thomas. Is this attempting to prohibit that, or is it something else? Madam Chair, committee members, that aligns with the fact pattern I laid out earlier, and so yes, that would prohibit that from being a bar for your entry to, to the program. Mr. Uni, would it prevent me from, uh, from applying to go to the University of St. Thomas for PSEO? No, Madam Th Chair. Thank you. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
So to clarify, could you, you could say we could have a faith statement, but you can't disqualify students based on that. You could add that language, correct? Mr. Ooney. B Madam Chair, committee members, I think that would be within the purview of the legislature in terms of the discussion we want to have what the final bill looks like. Our intent is to make it very clear in statute to not only students and families, and, but to post-secondary post institutions that any type of admission process, in this case what we're talking about, a faith-based statement, could not prohibit a student from, from entering the program uh, based on the PSEO uh, statute. Thank Senator you, and I'm sure we'll be moving forward to talk about this more. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think there's some confusion then from these faith-based organizations with how it's currently written. I represent Crown College, and it, it doesn't seem like anyone's on the same page here. This, this seems like they're not even allowed to have a faith-based statement in the application rather than not using that against the student's um, uh, admission. And what I'm hearing from these institutions, particularly Crown College, is Scripture is such a part of every lesson that they give, and their concern is that this is going to become a slippery slope as far as what they then cannot or can teach to these students. There are so many options for students to attend for PSEO that I am finding it hard to believe that this is going to impact whether or not they can participate in a program around the state of Minnesota. Um, so I would recommend at this point accepting the amendment, sitting down with these institutions and maybe workshopping this a little bit more uh, before it goes to the final version. Thank you. Um, to the amendment, members. Uh, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, and I'm not sure that the statement that um, Senator um, shared about at the federal level that it um, supersedes our state constitution. And um, as as legislators, we are here to uphold our state, legislat our state legislature, our, our constitution, and it's very explicit in our state constitution that public, let me just pull this up so that I make sure I'm saying this correctly. Um, section two of article 13, prohibition as to aiding sectarian schools. In no case shall any public money or property be appropriated or used for the support of schools wherein the distinctive doctrines, creeds, or tenets of any particular Christian or other religious sects are promulgated or taught. Um, that's really clear. And the fact that there are public dollars going to non-public entities is, is, you know, is in violation of our Constitution. I mean, I, I went to parochial schools all my life. I sent my children to parochial schools. Um, I don't expect the taxpayers to pay for my children's uh, education in that way. And as legislators, as um, stewards and tenants of the taxpayer dollars and recognizing the diversity of uh, our communities and um, the ability and the rights for each and every one of us to practice our religion, our creed as we please, um, we do still have to follow the state constitution. And so... Um, I, I know that this statement or this um, this um, addition to the bill does not prohibit that, and it doesn't um, prohibit PSEO students from attending non-public schools. But I think that it is something that we have to consider as legislators and as our responsibility to the people of Minnesota. Um, thank you, Senator Kunish. And members, I, I do want to move us to, to voting on the amendment because I'm assuming we have more too. So Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Minnesota Federation of Teachers at All Applets versus Gene Menegma, Commissioner of Education, Augsburg College, Court of Appeals of Minnesota, April 28, 1992. This
case explicitly upheld that PSEO is not a violation of the religious clause in the Minnesota Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Abler, Thank to you. your amendment. Well, and I, I appreciate the discussion. Um, I was just going to ask uh, somebody when this PSEO started, so it must have been before 92. Um, and this has been in practice a good long time. Um, I have a question for Senator Swazinski. It seems this is really a higher ed. Senator Abler, can we vote on your amendment and then you can ask questions? Oh, Madam Chair, it's to my amendment. Senator okay. Abler. Um, is this, is this going to go to higher ed, which I suggested go there? I'd, I'd be happy to send it there and then it could come back. Senator so this could be discussed with people who actually. Know That's not the plan, Senator. Senator Swazinski. Th thank you, Madam Chair. It's not the plan. Senator right. Abler. Well, Madam Chair, I wish it were the plan. Um, and I didn't come to heckle anybody about the processes of the session, but there's committees with jurisdictions, and this committee has no jurisdiction over higher ed. Um, we have jurisdiction over K-12, and we're involving the practices of a higher ed thing. So I just, I mean, would you consider that? And so <clears throat> if, um, and I appreciate the way the homeschool community has turned out with their concerns about the previous part of the bill, and I appreciate the department and the chair addressing those concerns. Um, I made the amendment to create the discussion so there's a basis upon which we could have this semi-extended discussion. There's a much longer discussion to be had um, with people who are, should be in the room who would understand these things. Um, but I will remind the department, all the goals you have on your 10 things <clears throat> are about helping kids get through school. And I learned in the Human Services Committee from Voices and Choices uh, racial equity is a condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in the statistical sense how one fares in society. I think that's an amazing way to say what we're all after. And in this bill, you have many ways to, to achieve the equity that we so all want, to have both in terms of health care, educational opportunities, getting on to higher ed and into success. And I'm going to point out to you that I believe passing this, keeping this in the bill, is actually going to be counterproductive to that. Um, Northwestern College has 1,700 students in its PSEO program, many of which are being drawn into a college opportunity that might not otherwise go. And as we find a way, it's so, oh, there's only 10 out of 1,700. I don't know if it's 100 or if it's however many of those are in any of the at-risk category. But if you save one, we all say we've saved the community. And I'm going to urge you to have more discussions offline about this. Senator Swodzinski, I know your thoughtfulness about this. I think we realize it is legal the way it's going, but I don't think it's productive. And Madam Chair, it was not my intention to bring this to a vote today, but I wanted to have a sincere discussion about this because it's a big deal. Since the communities who are affected by this and the colleges and the students who succeeded as a BIPOC, as a whatever student that they finally found their way, couldn't testify today because we're not having testimony. They would have come. You would have heard from probably 20 students and probably a dozen schools about how this has helped them to get to the very goals you say you want to do for free. So we'll discuss this some more, uh, and I presume just by Mr. Senator Swazinski's approach to life and the department's openness and the body language that we can discuss this. And so, Madam Chair, with that, I'll withdraw my amendment. Uh, Senator Abler withdraws his oral amendment. Uh, members, further discussion on the bill? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a, a few questions. I'm just going to kind of work through the bill. Um, I promise you many of them are not very exciting, uh, but they are questions I have nonetheless, if that's okay. Uh, the first one is on uh, page 5, uh, line 5.5 through 5.7. There's a portion of the bill uh, that deletes this language. After the rules authorized under this subdivision are initially adopted, the commissioner may not amend or repeal these rules, nor adopt new rules on the same topic without specific legislative authority. Of course, I'm always suspicious of any time the legislature seems to be uh, ceding any of its authority or practicing its uh, job of oversight regarding departments. So I'm just wondering what the reasoning is behind the removal of this language, please. Mr. Ooney. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, uh, thanks for the opportunity to clarify this. this. I think was the subject of a little bit of um, question and answer with Senator Abler. So this has to go back to um, a question that we got from an administrative law judge when we were reviewing and revising the art standards around does the department have the ongoing rulemaking authority to review and revise academic standards. And in the academic standards statute, it's clear to us 
that, um, in lieu of this statute, that uh, we have the directive from the legislature uh, from statutes to review and revise all academic standards now on a rolling 10-year cycle. And so we believe it's clear in statute. The ALJ raised this as, is, it, does this bring this into question? We don't think it did. But to be absolutely clear that we do have the ongoing authority based on what is in the other statutes, the 10-year review and revision statutes, um, we'd seek to remove this to, to remove any lack of clarity in this space. If I may, Madam Chair. Senator Duckworth. Thank you. <clears throat> so this would seek to specifically um, clarify that the legislature does not need to approve any changes to academic standards in language arts, math, science, social studies, via the arts, et cetera, that, that could simply be done by the Department of Education. Mr. Uni. Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Duckworth, we don't, it, it would clarify that we don't need additional uh, authorization, that the authorization to engage in that process is all, we've already been directed to do that by the legislature in statute. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, bear with me as I find my next question. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I look to pages 11 and 12, um, there's a significant portion of the bill that deletes uh, what's in law, lines uh, 11.26 to 12.14, and it's deleting language that kind of defines things like um, uh, assessments or results that would be on grade level, below grade level, or above grade level. I'm just wondering the reasoning behind the deletion of this language. Mr. Uni. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Duckworth, um, and, and I do appreciate this question with, uh, you know, this is another proposal that we've had several years now. Um, originally, these sections were added, I think, 10, 12 years ago to allow for kind of a, what was thought at the time, a dynamic, uh, comprehensive assessment experience where if a student is performing above grade level or below grade level, the, the assessment would adjust the difficulty of their questions. Shortly thereafter, all, um, I don't want to say consequence, but all, um, anything that relied on the performance on those, uh, on those questions went away. There was a career and college readiness indicator that was no longer used in the K through 12 system or by any higher education institution. Um, the actual questions do not have any impact on the student's scores. Those are for additional indicators. Those indicators went away. Went away. And so our students were resulting in having, have been, since those went away, have been uh, taking additional questions that have no relevance to their, their MCA scores that we see reported out. And so we feel that this has been students taking extra time on tests. I think it's like 10 questions or 10% of their questions end up having this. So the intent of this is to reduce the amount of time that students are taking tests on questions that have no impact on their scores or on any career colleges, uh, college readiness indicators. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Uni. So it's not to say that we're not going to continue to still talk about or assess our kids as to how they're performing in terms of it's at or below grade level, above grade level, what have you. That's still going to be used to assess and help them succeed academically, those terms. Mr. Co Uni. Yeah, correct. This is purely about the questions that they're given on the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessments. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may continue. Senator Duckworth, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> on page... Uh, 21 and 20, it talks about uh, food programs that the Department of Education oversees, uh, summer programs, uh, programs for children, um, et cetera. And I see a lot of added language here, and I guess my, my main question is this, and I'm not trying to bring up an issue purely for the purpose that it, one might think I'm bringing it up, right? Uh, the question is, if we're adding language, if we're adding duties and responsibilities of the department on how they're going to approach these programs. Um, is there any language or has been any, given any thought to adding language that would specifically spell out ongoing monitoring and accountability of these programs to prevent things like have happened in the re recent past? Mr. Uni. Man, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, again, 
thank you for all of your questions. I appreciate the opportunity to shed some more light on these on these issue areas to flesh them out. These are long bills, and sometimes we don't have the opportunity to, to dive deeply into them. Yeah, so since this is the policy bill, this is areas where we believe that we can improve expectations on our sponsors and our sites in terms of complying with the uh, requirements under these programs. For the specific monitoring and oversight duties, we are pretty firm that we need resources to be able to um, to be able to improve in that space. So that would go to our budget bill. Our budget bill has two major proposals in that space. One is to create an office <coughs> of inspector general at the uh, at MDE, which would have authority to in, uh, oversee or not oversee, but investigate and monitor any uh, issues in any programs. But uh, one of the areas that they would focus on is federal programs as well. We do also have a proposal that would allow us to have a um, strengthened um, auditing team that would be able to look at programs that districts and charters run as well. So that is a that is a budget ask. That again, I feel like some of the to also to Senator Abler's questions that we're excited to show you our budget bill because we have solutions in that. In that space as well. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cooney. That's very helpful. I'll look forward to that uh, in that bill as well. On page 22, lines 22.19 and 22.20 um, removes this language. A pupil may participate in the program and accelerate attainment of grade level requirements or graduation requirements. Um, and it's under a subdivision, the slave program established. I'm just wondering why that's being removed. Um, to me, at first glance, when I look at it, it seems like something that we'd want, we would want to encourage or want to have. So again, just curious as to why that's being removed from the from law. Ms. Ariola. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Duckworth, um, the short answer is that graduation acceleration programs don't exist anymore. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I asked. Yep. Uh, on the following page, page 23, line 23.3. Um, it says a pupil who is between the ages of currently 16, but that's scratched out and changed to 17, and 21 may enroll in adult basic education programs. Um, just wondering why we are changing that and, and shrinking the age range of folks that could enroll. Um, I'll leave it at that. Ms. Ariola. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, um, so this alignment a, uh, aligns to federal ABE standards for 17 to 21 year olds and also um, students in Minnesota at age 16 still have to be enrolled in K-12 schools, so they can't be enrolled in a K-12 school and also participating in an ABE program. If I may, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, thank you. So are, are, there, are there any students that, uh, I guess my question is this, I understand what you just shared and I appreciate that. Are there, are there kids that would otherwise like to be or could be allowed to enroll in these things at the age of 16 that otherwise won't be able to even though they would like to? Ms. Ariola. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, not to my knowledge. Um, I'm happy to take that back to the team to double check, but by my understanding, um, the kids who are 16 have a compulsory requirement to be in a K-12 school. And um, so by definition, ABE programs are supposed to be offered to adults outside of the um, K-12 education system. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your answer. Um, if I direct you to page 33, there's a section called School Libraries and Media Centers. I probably just caught the attention of the person sitting next to me over here. <laughs> uh, so it's under that section, but the, the portion I have a question about is on page 34. Um, there's an addition of language on lines 34.4 to 34.6, and my question really has to do with this portion of it. It says um, that an intellectual and academic freedom statement is required. Uh, I'm just curious as to what that means or what an example of that might be. So a school library or school library media center must have the following characteristics. And one of those is- Madam Chair. Senator Zizinski. Can, can, um, Senator, can you tell us what line you're reading? Exactly. So Senator. first I'll read, Ma Mr. Madam mm -hmm. Chair, thank you. Line 34.1 says a school library or school library media center must have the following characteristics. And if you look down toward the end of line 34.5, it says an intellectual and academic freedom statement. I'm just wondering what that is, what it means, the, the purpose behind maybe why it found its way into this bill. Uh, Ms. Rooney or Ms. Ariola. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth. Um, this definition has been 
came, was part of a collaborative effort with the department and the school library community to create the language that they felt was um, aligned with best practice and uh, actually reflective of the work that school libraries do. I would have to defer to an actual school librarian, if there's one in the room, about whether this is something that uh, is already done in libraries or not, but I do know that this was at the request of the school librarians themselves. So I would, uh, I will defer if needed. Senator Kunish. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and the rest of you on taking such a close look at this. I am not familiar with the intellectual and academic freedom statement other than the, um, and for those that are listening, I was a library media specialist in elementary schools for 20 years. And um, I don't uh, recall an intellectual and academic freedom statement other than we, are, we were um, tasked with providing a wide uh, variety of materials, whether it was hard copy, online, magazines, um, those sort of things that would not, um, uh, squelch the intellectual and academic freedom of our students and I don't know that we um, I don't know what that statement is myself but now that you have brought that up I'm very curious so thank you Senator Duckworth uh, thank you madam chair uh, thank you Senator Kunish um, look forward to just getting some more clarity as it pertains to that on page 40 uh, lines 40.16 and 40.17 uh, and I should say this is under the subheading of revisions and reviews required. It states the Commissioner of Education must embed ethnic studies as relates to the academic standards during the review and revision of required academic standards. So my question here uh, relates to the role of school boards, local communities, parents, their ability to determine, control, curriculum, what's presented in the classroom, et cetera. I understand that there is a process in place per state statute that has MDE along with others look at and evaluate curriculum, academic standards, et cetera. So is this gonna go through that same process or are we saying the commissioner is gonna directly tell uh, school boards what their curriculum is gonna be as it pertains to these lines in this bill? Uh, Mr. Uni. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, I'll, I'll first start with, uh, um, with the clarification that this portion, um, our academic standards review process does not have to do with the curriculum that districts and charters deliver in their classroom. The state is tasked under statute to review and revise academic standards and benchmarks. So those are the topics and issue areas that we all feel that our children need to learn about um, and then specific um, information points or concepts that they need to learn about. It is then up to the districts and charters to determine what particular curriculum, so the local assessments, the books, the programming that they want to use to deliver those academic standards and have students meet those standards and benchmarks. So this process would just stay at the academic standards. What's the information uh, uh, concept or information item that we feel our students need to learn across their grade level? So this would embed the concept of ethnic studies across our academic standards, whether it be social studies, mathematics, science, arts, um, or English language arts. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uni. So if I understood you correctly, it's embedding this in terms of curriculum, but you're saying it's up to districts to determine how to implement or what, what um, materials they would use at their level in their classrooms regarding it. Mr. Uni. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, I, again, I would, I, I, I'll, I'll just have to clarify. It's, it's not embedding in curriculum. Curriculum is the, is the body of work that the district and charter have oversight over for their students. And that's how they put together their textbooks, what programming, what assessments they want to use at the local level to deliver the academic standards. So the academic standards are separate from curriculum. And I want to be very clear that we're not we're not creating curriculum for districts. I know there's proposals out there for the department to create curriculum, or sometimes we help, uh, if we're guided by statute or session law to, um, to gather resources that districts can use to construct their curriculum. But we do not, uh, in, this, uh, in this proposal here or in statute, do we engage in creating curriculum. 
Um, but to, to, your, to your point, this would embed the concepts or the information points that students need to learn uh, statewide. And then it would still be up to the district or charter to be able to deliver the programming and textbooks and other uh, items to be able to deliver those academic standards, those information points, those concepts. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Uni. Uh, in the interest of time, there are some other aspects of the bill that this touches on that, that might allow me to, to dive a little bit deeper with that question. So I'll, I'll save it for when we get to that portion, but I appreciate the information you've provided so far. Uh, moving on to uh, page 52. Uh, this gets into uh, some requirements that charter schools would have to abide by in order to become a, an authorizer here in the state of Minnesota. And on line 52.29, it requires a market need and demand study. That's an addition. I'm wondering uh, what the reason is for this addition, and I'm wondering if an application can be denied on the basis of a market need and demand study. Um, Ms. Ariola. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, the, um, to the first part of the question about um, where did this, why, the why of this, I believe, um, is for, as I touched on briefly in my presentation, is because we want to make sure that these charters are going to stick, are going to stay and are going to be successful. Um, as, as most businesses do when they open a new site, they often participate in market need and demand studies. Um, we, did, we have had this in our proposal in prior years and have engaged with our associates um, in the charter school world and they're fine with this as far as we have heard, um, that it's not a substantial ask for them. Um, I, it would depend on the uh, specifics of the results of the study about what would happen to the application at that stage. I do know that for charter authorizer applications, we do return it to them if we have more questions or want more clarity. So I would imagine that it would undergo those same aspects of the process, that if we do want more information or feel that the um, what's been provided for us in the study has left us with unanswered questions, we would take those back first and not start by denial, if that makes sense. Senator Duckworth. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to take you at your word that you haven't really received much pushback from them on that. Uh, my concern is that uh, a, a market need and demand study could be somewhat subjective, and I would hate to see mm -hmm. potential applications be denied uh, based on something that's, that's kind of maybe subjective. So, um, But I appreciate the information there. Moving on to page 57, uh, lines 57.16 through 57.19. Uh, these words are, are stricken. A charter school may give enrollment preference to children currently enrolled in the school's free preschool or pre-kindergarten program under this section who are eligible to enroll in kindergarten in the next school year. Wondering why that's being removed. Uh, Ms. Ariola. Then Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, thank you for the question. Um, so we, um, we know that uh, options for preschoolers and options for kindergartners are different pools of opportunity. Um, so in order to make sure that the families who have begun their educational journey in the charter schools are aware of the full range of options to them, which they may not have been aware of when they enrolled in the charter school's uh, preschool program, this is meant to encourage that so that there's not that automatic roll of, rollover into kindergarten with the families feeling like they didn't have a chance to explore their options. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that answer. I would imagine that is maybe one that charter schools aren't thrilled about the removal of. I could be wrong. Um, but the fact that they can't give enrollment preference to, ch to kids that are already enrolled in their, sco their school's program seems to be a little uh, counterintuitive. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot with the question, so I don't expect um, a detailed answer. But I, it, it, it flagged and gave me a little bit of cause for concern why we would take away their ability to do that. I uh, do have an answer. Oh, we'll go, well, please. <laughs> Ms. Adiola. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Duckworth. So if you look um, on the following page under 58.4 to 58.11, there are a few carve outs in there regarding um, just the eligibility and what the charter school can do if those students do apply for enrollment, that they can give them preference if they do choose to go back to that school. There's also, I need to dig it out in my 
control F of the bill, but there's also a provision that if there is a um, sibling enrolled in the charter school, yep. that that preschooler can have preference there to go into kindergarten as well. So we hope that that addresses some of those concerns about families' options and keeping them in education that space Senator, that works for them. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the answer. I did see that other portion there, so I appreciate it. I just want to make sure that we're, we're making it easy for these kids to progress in, in whatever school they're choosing to be a member of. Um, on page 59, um, under the section called Least Space, mm -hmm. there's an addition on line 59.7 which says, in all cases, the eligible lessor, uh, the person leasing the building, must also be the building owner. And then further down on 59.14, it says that, um, um, that that corporation or that, that building owner uh, whoever has a lease can only serve that particular charter school. Uh, I'm just wondering the reasoning behind these very specific uh, pieces of language being added to the bill. Ms. Ariola. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, so these um, two provisions here are the, the overall intent is to make sure that the charter schools are getting the attention that they deserve from the folks invested in the school's operation, which includes the building owner and the uh, affiliated building company. What we had, what we had, then we had this brought to us by charter schools. We were hearing that schools were leasing from a sub, were, were being a sub lessor, and the lessor would just disappear or they would suddenly be out of business or there would be changes to the contract that they felt was not in alignment with the school's needs. So in order to, to A, streamline the process, take out, I don't like the word middleman, but that's the only thing that's coming to my head right now. I mean, but, it's the definition of a sublease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so to that point, to make sure that the people who are responsible for the physical location of the charter school are meeting the requirements that they have to that school to provide a safe physical environment for the kids and that it's something that the, abides by the terms of the contract the charters uh, sign. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that answer. I would just say it, it would be something to keep an eye on over the years. Uh, I don't want to take away the ability for folks to take on leases, even if it might be a sublease, if it's less expensive, it happens to meet their time frame, it's a good facility, it's in a great location. Um, and so removing some of that flexibility, if it does lead to issues in the future that we're made aware of, it might be worth revisiting to make sure that we don't put them in a, a position that hampers what they're trying to accomplish. That's the only reason I ask. Um, if I move on to, I am dropping some questions as I move, I promise, but we're almost there, we're halfway through the bill anyway. Your time, Senator Duckworth. Thank you so much. On uh, page 67, um, I just wanna highlight this because I've heard districts communicate fairly significant issues regarding how this plays out across the state. Uh, lines 67.3 through 67.5 says, a pupil receiving school-based or school-linked mental health services in the district uh, under the site statute, continues to be eligible for those services until the pupil is enrolled in a new district. And the reason I raise this is there's been instances in which um, a student maybe uh, moves or they somehow become officially a resident of a new district. And even though that district wasn't a part of the process of that student being referred to mental uh, health services, et cetera, that district then becomes financially responsible for sometimes very, very large sums of money. And it could be a fairly small district that all of a sudden is expected to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. And for a good cause, of course. Uh, but, and I think I had a bill to try to help solve this last year. I just wanna raise awareness to the fact that there are situations like this that occur, and whatever we can do to help those districts would be extremely important. There was actually a case in which a student was referred out of state they weren't even in Minnesota anymore receiving these services, and that school district was still responsible to cover the cost of all that. So um, any thoughts or any insight you have that you could share specific to that would be of interest to me. Mr. Ernie. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, I appreciate, and again, I appreciate the question. Uh, this goes to the overarching purpose and intent of these policies is to when a student or when a student is unfortunately in a situation or engages in behavior where they find themselves uh, excluded or expelled and we know that many times right now they find themselves and families find themselves completely cut off from the school system and we know that that's where many issues can continue to arise or become unaddressed if they don't have access to those services and so this 
um, eligibility for these services pertains per specific in this proposal specifically if you look at 66.284 expulsion and exclusion dismissals and people withdrawal agreements and so I think it's a little bit a smaller subsect than I think the example than you provided so from the cost containment perspective I think we're looking there but the real purpose of this is to keep the student connected to the school system in some way where we know those supports are until they have access to those supports in a new school district Senator Duckworth uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I would just encourage you to take a look at uh, some of those other instances that I described and how we can help our districts uh, handle some of that expense. Maybe there's something the state can do uh, in regard to those instances. Um, on the same page, uh, and I guess I'll, uh, to save time, I'll just make a statement ra rather than ask a question about this. Uh, lines 67.29 to 67.31 uh, talk about prone, restraint, and certain physical holds that are not allowed um, in the language goes on to page 68 uh, under letter B to describe certainly things we don't want uh, people doing as it relates to our kids in schools. But my concern is uh, one of the limitations uh, placed upon personnel at schools here has to do with school resource officers or police officers contracted with the district. Um, and, and it puts some limitations on what they're able to do to, to keep folks safe and sometimes handle situations. So I would just say, you know, maybe let's get some, some feedback there if we haven't from districts and from school resource officers who have to deal with this on a daily basis to make sure that we're not uh, precluding them from doing something that they might need to have to do in a situation to keep folks safe and deal with what they have to at a school. Obviously, in a way in which uh, still meets the uh, language on the following page from lines 68.1 to 68.5 which talks about making sure that people can breathe and not having any uh, particular instances in which you're causing them additional harm. Uh, I just noticed when we were saying that our school resources officers couldn't uh, even do that, um, I could see some instances in which that might hamstring what they're trying to accomplish. Moving on to page uh, 80, 82 and 83. Uh, at the very bottom of page 82, the last two lines, and if you look on page 83, there's a section of language that's deleted from uh, line 12 to 15. It talks about eliminating things that have to do with different tiers of licensure. And my question is, what's the purpose for deleting these and are we eliminating pathways for teachers to stay in the classroom and or to maintain that licensure or progress through their level of tiers of licensure? Mr. Oney. Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, so these proposals are a little bit two, two different tiers of uh, approaches here. One is, pardon me, no one even laughed at that point, I apologize. Um, to, the, to, to the first one is um, eliminating, or eliminating a limitation on a tier one teacher to uh, become part of a collective bargaining unit. So there's no changes to ability to access a license or exist on a particular license in that one. So appreciate the opportunity to provide clarity here. The second one is the elimination of the um, ability to use three years of experience on a two, tier two license to access a tier three license. This is a proposal we've carried several years um, now and I think the purpose is going to what we believe is the the qualification need, needed to have an ongoing license, whether it be a tier three or tier four license. And there needs to be uh, more experience, or I'm sorry, more uh, qualifications um, and specifically around, um, you know, exposure to, or exposure participation in a teacher prep program, which isn't guaranteed under uh, the tier two license. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I want to make sure I understand you correctly. <clears throat> so specific to the, the portion that you referenced, this is lines 12 through 15. It says three years of teaching experience under a tier two license and evidence of summative teacher evaluations that did not result in placing or otherwise keeping the teacher on an improvement process. So are, are we saying that, that folks who otherwise would have qualified under this language no longer will be able to? Mr. Oney. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, I, and I should have clarified, the, the amendment provides a little bit more flexibility in that. We, we've, again, we've pursued this, uh, this change or this tweak um, I shouldn't say tweak, this change uh, for several years. One of the additions that we are pursuing this year to that proposal that is in the amendment, if you look on, uh, if you have the amendment in front of you, lines 1.6 to 1.8, 
the the change would not <coughs> cut off the opportunity starting on when the policy bill goes into effect. I think it's August 1st, 2023, if it's just policy. Um, it would provide a grandfather clause. So everybody who has a tier two license uh, as of June 30th, 2023, would still be eligible to use this pathway, the three years of tier two experience with no summative, summative um, um, negative summative evaluation. Um, are being put on a, uh, an improvement process, they would have that opportunity to use that experience until June 30th, 2026. But at that point, then the pathway would no longer exist under this proposal. Senator Duckworth, follow up? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Uni. So I sound like a broken record at times um, on this committee as it relates to teachers and pathways and tier licensure. And so I would just say if there are things that we can do, if we're, if we're going to pass some laws that continue to to potentially limit the pathways to becoming a teacher of a higher tier, staying in the classroom, teaching our kids, especially in the midst of a shortage, uh, that we look at those options. What can we do to help encourage great teachers to continue to stay in the classroom, advance on their level of tiers of licensure so that we're not losing them and they can stay in front of our kids and help us fill a lot of the shortages that we're, that we're seeing in the classroom? I know that's not all you. Some of that's Pelsby, and every time they're here, I bring it up too, uh, so they hear the same thing. Um, but a lot, of those, a lot of those folks, a lot of those teachers are the exact same folks who in the Teachers of Color Bill we're trying to help and we're trying to help keep in the classroom. So whatever we can do to be in alignment with that amongst all of the bills and legislation we're trying to do, the better. And I can see that maybe you have something to add. Madam Chair. Mr. Ooney. Senator Duckworth, I would be remiss if I didn't yet again. If it's in that budget bill. <laughs> Senator <Fiscal Duckworth. laughs> side. It's, it's difficult when we when we look at uh, policy bills. And again, I'll just say under the Do North Education Plan, there's a lot of alignment between our policies that we pursue and our budget. But sometimes when you see them separated, you don't get to see the whole picture. And so when we look at the budget bill, we have a lot of teacher supports, recruitment, retention, mentoring policies in there that not only focus on diversification of our teacher workforce, by lifting up our teachers to get them the um, not only the li correct licensure with uh, licensure that they need, but access to resources to um, cover licensure exams, to um, be able to uh, focus on a range of teacher shortage areas, whether it be in special education, early childhood, but as well as those mentoring and retention supports that they need as well. And again, I would say we are excited to share the budget bill for in further committees and share with you kind of some of the opportunities that we're providing there. Senator Duckworth. Very good. I appreciate it. I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. uh, page 91. Um, it talks about plan implementation components, and I just want to highlight lines 21 to 23. It says, a school board of each eligible district must formally adopt and implement a long-term plan under this section. The plan must incorporate into the district's comprehensive strategic plan, and then it goes on to say on line, uh, excuse me, on page 92, Line five, the plan must contain goals for, I'm going to go down to letter C, which talks about the plan must include strategies to validate, affirm, embrace, and integrate cultural and community strengths of all students, families, and employees in the district's curriculum, as well as learning and work environments. The plan must address issues of institutional racism as defined as other portions of this bill. So again, this gets back to the conversation that I keep trying to have as it relates to local control, school boards, parents, the community, and what MDE uh, is maybe trying to legislate. So before we had a conversation about standards, and you said, well, we're talking about standards, we're not talking about curriculum necessarily. Well, now how I read this is we're requiring districts to implement certain things regarding their curriculum. So I'm looking for some clarity here. Mr. Uni. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Duckworth, so just to, just to clarify for everyone, this is under the Achievement and Integration uh, Statute, and so this has specific, this statute currently has specific requirements and goals around um, leveraging the um, Leveraging the diversity that certain districts, I think there's like 100 districts that are required to participate in this program, um, have in uh, to leverage the diversity and makeup of the district to be able to improve achievement for all students and to engage in a range of different um, strategies 
to be able to lift up our reading math scores, um, our readiness for K, as well as our uh, high school graduation rates. And so this identifies those strategies that districts should be looking at and, and does name out um, curriculum as something they need to, but it is not identifying the particular um, items that a district needs to in, uh, implement in their curriculum. It is just themes and strategies that they need to make sure that they're implementing in their curriculum. Senator Duckworth and I, I, I'm sure you're getting close to the end, but we are also getting close to the end of committee and we have some folks who have questions too. So I'll just, you can continue on, but I just want to Thank time you. check. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I am, I am really almost done. And I do appreciate everyone's patience. Uh, so I hear what you're saying. I really do. And I'm, I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt here. But as you can imagine, this is a topic that uh, generates a lot of questions and a lot of feedback from constituents and folks. And as I continue on to page 93, there are certain references to other things that are defined in this bill, uh, terms like anti-racist, culturally sustaining, institutional racism, ethnic studies curriculum, et cetera. And the way that, that I read this bill is that it is pretty explicitly telling districts, or at least some districts, what they must do um, as it relates to some of these subjects. And it kind of takes some of that control or some of how a district would determine to go about teaching kids in the classroom in consultation with parents in the community and it kind of spells out what they must do. And we can, we can have that conversation about, well, we're telling them they have to teach about it, but we're really not telling them how they have to teach about it. Well, when they, when they read state statute and they're being told that they have to do something, well, we know what that means in terms of how it's gonna be carried out in the classroom potentially. So I just wanna be very clear that if, if the state has a process um, for input as it pertains to standards, not even curriculum, but the standards that we're going to talk about, and before we talked about how we are saying certain things must be included or embedded within standards, there's a very important public process for input that exists. It is outside the legislature. I acknowledge that. But what I don't want to see happen is that process be skipped or not fully embraced as it pertains to the input of community members. And I also don't want to see the Department of Education uh, supersede what local school boards intend to do or would like to do when it comes to educating their kids in consultation with parents in the local community. That's why I ask those questions. Uh, I won't get into the weeds on some of the other stuff that would probably take us over time, Madam Chair. Uh, but to me, it's very, very important that that process get the time and attention that it's due and that we are respecting the localist of levels to implement and decide how they're going to carry this out in the classroom. Mr. Do you have a response? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Duckworth, uh, um, I, I would just in, in the vein of, you know, the very important vein of um, being able to deliver these expectations that are set in statute around what all of our students should learn and be exposed to and how a community can deliver it that's best for their community and where is the local um, local direction there and in you know in the the language starting on 9.92.5 you know it says the plan must contain goals for achieving these particular items and if you go back to 91. Point Two, three, the plan must be incorporated into the district's comprehensive strategic plan under section 120B.11, which refers back to the world's, first, uh, world's best workforce uh, plan that districts must develop to be able to um, set out the goals that they, um, that they must strive to meet. And there's, five, there's five goals that they uh, strive to meet for their uh, students' achievements and outcomes. And um, in that process, this plan, Achievement Integration, or there's a couple other plans that fit under the world's best workforce, must be developed at the board level as well as in collaboration with their communities. There are a, there's a parent advisory group that helps with the world's best, work, uh, world's best workforce plan. And then every year, the district must uh, hold a public meeting where they share the plan and receive public input on those plans. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. Now, I would just say that I hear what you're saying, and I read that, and that also caused me a little bit of uh, concern. In my opinion, I would say that that's going even further beyond academic standards. It's going even further beyond curriculum. You're telling school boards this has to be a part of your long-term or your long-range planning or the vision for your district. When 
as somebody who helped a school board, or excuse me, a school district formulate their vision for their kids in consultation with their community, uh, that was something that I felt uh, was very much, should, uh, that should be respected that at, the, at the lowest local level, that, that's who should be deciding that and how we want to meet the objectives of the academic standards that we have to and then choose whatever cl uh, curriculum we're going to do to, to teach our, our kids. Now, earlier we talked about certain things that, that we can't teach through the lens of when we were talking about Senator Abler's amendment. Now we're telling districts you will teach through the lens of these certain things. And so I would be remiss if I didn't kind of point out a little bit of what seems to be a double standard or hypocrisy there. It's not directed at you, um, but that's, that's the, the friction I see when it comes to local level, local control, districts, parents, and the community, and what we're trying at a top-down level to attempt to do as it relates to the state or the department. So I'll leave it with there, and I don't even have any more questions, but I do have just a couple of things to sum up with. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as a Republican lead on higher education, I, I guess I would have to agree with Senator Abler that if, if this were to come before us, I wouldn't be disappointed. Uh, there is some stuff that has to relate with higher ed in here, so it might be worth a conversation. I promise not to have as many questions. Um, I look forward to seeing the budget bill. I really do, uh, because you alleviated some of my questions. I know that we're talking policy, but I really hope that the budget bill really dives into specifics on how we're assessing our kids and helping them catch up and succeed academically, especially after a few years of disruption. Um, and I'm very, very hopeful that it includes a very robust plan as it pertains to literacy and helping our little kids learn to read as early as possible. Um, that's probably the number one concern and priority that we should be discussing in both education committees. How do we help our kids who have fallen behind, catch up, and succeed academically? And how are we ensuring that they can read? Because that sets them up for success in life. Uh, all the other bills that we have talked about and will talk about are of value, but those have to be the priority. Thank you. Senator Duckworth, I have a really exciting bill. Good, I'm you glad You probably hear. want to be on with me. Um, Senator Abler, then Senator Kunish. Members, I'm just going to time check real quick. We have 11 minutes left. And are there any other members? Okay. Thank Senator you, Madam Abler. Chair. Uh, so, Senator Swinsinski, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Swinsinski, um, the questions I have cannot possibly fit in 10 minutes. Do you plan to take this bill up again so we can finish our overview of it? Senator Swinsinski. No, I'm No, I'm not. Oh. Well, Madam Senator Chair, Abler. Senator Sosinski, I just don't understand why you wouldn't. This is not a small bill. I'll try to go over my topics, just to be fair, but this is not a small bill. It is very controversial to many people. We haven't even touched on some of the most controversial elements. Senator Abler, I, I'll um, just say that I believe the plan is to lay this over, so we will have to take it back up again. But thank you, but not for purposes of discussion. So anyway, I just, we'll take it offline, but you're a good chair, Mr. Chair, but some things need more time than simply two hours, and Senator Duckworth was not dilatory in his questions. He, he didn't even get to ask all the ones he had. So I'll go over my topics, and hopefully the department can come with me. I think what you don't want is to spend time on the floor having discussed things that we could have discussed here and actually cleaned up. So um, just don't respond unless you think you have to. But uh, on page 20, the Speeding Our Futures thing that was covered, uh, is that, just I do have to ask you, is, is there going to be another, is, that, is there an ongoing version of that? The, the Federal Summer Food Service Program, is that going to be continuing while well, you have to set up rules for it? Mr. That, Cooney. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abel, yes, this is an ongoing program where there is food distributed during the summer right. as well as to the child and adult care right. programs. Well, this is my thought about the whole thing. Senator we should Abel. not give it to nonprofits. We should use the districts or the county. They know who's hungry. Schools have methods. Um, that's all I can say about that since I'm out of Mr. time. Ma Ma Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abel, I would just remind the committee that it's a federal program um, that's run and not, uh, not a state-run uh, state program. So. Senator Abel. Right, but I don't know why we don't run it through the schools. I just I mean, there's not time to talk about it, so we'll take it offline. But I just, that whole thing would have been avoided if you'd just given my, the money to Anoka, which happens to be the world's largest school district in Minnesota. So um, anyway, and... I just have to skip some of this stuff. I'm, I'm curious, just take it, tell me later on 27.6, uh, they're incorporating programs and services. I'm wondering what services they are. I do have a big question I want to talk about. 
um, line. These are legitimate questions, Mr. Chair. On line page 27, this online thing, Online Instruction Act. Um, currently, homeschool students get to use online instruction as part of some way that they get that. Does this affect them at all in their selection of that through however they're doing it now? Just say yes or no. Uh, uh, Mr. Oney. Madam Chair, Senator Abel or no. Okay. And then in the repealer Senator. on page 3R, subdivision 5, you repeal uh, that participation in extracurricular activities, online student may participate in, in extracurricular activities. Is that affected at all? Uh, Ms. Abiola? This? Oh, sorry, Mr. Senator Abler, uh, no, they should still be able to participate in those okay. activities. Just making sure. Language. Senator Abler. Um, right. Some things I just Ma Madam Chair, uh, oh, Mr. Senator yeah. Abler, just to clarify that repealer in the back is we are doing a repeal and replace of the online learning right. act. So th there is no intent to, to, to change that But they can that still access. be online yes. tied to ANOCA and be a part of ANOCA. Okay, thanks. Um, just briefly on the uh, library thing, um, I'm. Uh, is that... A new standards for libraries uh, that was it's new language saying you have to have a site and you have to have licensed staff and you have to have these policies is that is there nothing written elsewhere that says what you have to do Ms. Ariola uh, Madam Chair Senator Abler no um, and that was the impetus for convening these conversations to create a definition was because there was none um, in statute before yeah, Senator Abler I'm just surprised you have to say on 34 7 it's housed in a central location like Really? I thought you had to write that down. I do have a, just a question for someone to figure out. 34.2, um, every student has equitable access to resources. I, I think our district has like 30 languages. I mean, just think about what that might mean in these words. I just, and as you wordsmith that, I'm not going to ask you to uh, comment about that. Um, I, um, on line 39.13, all these standards, um, and I am... Pro inclusion. Everybody should know that. I've been including before it was even popular. Um, but I just wonder on line 39.13 and 39.14, it says consistent with recommendations from the tribal nations. Um, I presume they'll have input, but they don't get to just to say. I mean, nobody gets to say what's in it. You're going to listen to them, and it, it seems like really strong. Um, so I, I just think you might mean to say that there's input, and you're going to listen to everybody and come up with some cool standards. Is that what you mean? Or do they have veto power? Mm, Mr. Uni. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Abler, um, this is just codifying current practice right now that we engage in yeah. co tribal consultation as well as the standards process, yeah. um, a uh, collaborative that's model with a That's range. what I thought you yeah. meant. So Senator just making Abler. sure. Um, anyway, um, I guess uh, as we've talked about this, I, I think that I just feel a pressure of time, but I, I think it's important that we learn about our history. And frankly, the more I've learned about tribal history, the more I grieve because it's horrible how it's worked out. Um, and I, you know, it's important to put that in as an element of things to learn. And I presume that's what you're after. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, this market needs study. I'm nervous about it. Um, we heard from Pillsbury schools. I founded a charter school. Um, there was a time that charter schools were not at all liked by the establishment. Um, there are some areas where charter schools are not liked by the current establishment. And for some people, charter schools have been their lifesaver. And so just because it doesn't meet the market need based upon whomever might be the political will to squish them, I just caution you just that this is one indicator. You might actually, you don't want them to fail but you don't want to have them not have a chance to succeed. So that's my caveat to you about that. Um, and this thing about the letting the, the little, the preschool kids stick on with, you know, they, they have to, I mean, I, I don't understand the interaction there, but you're trying to, like, again, community, helping people go, this is our school, and it's, it, it's if they're there as a preschool or it's their school, they feel like they're connected. So I just am nervous that you, they can't continue on, having done so much with our charter school. So um, I think there's another one or two big things. Oh, and this the discipline thing. 
I uh, just heard it from the hallway. You would have testimony just concerned about this. I understand there's meetings going on. Please sort it out with my district. We have a really put together district. You don't want to make it worse for them. Some students, I, I just was talking to a teacher, well, to a, a teacher who told me about a teachers that are afraid to do hall duty because they're afraid to be in the halls. And like, really? I mean, look where it's just come to. And some students need to be diverted away and we need to make sure that, they're, that they feel safe. And I guess I'll leave it at one more thing. Um, and I brought this up to in a different, well, in this committee, maybe. Um, on, line, on page 73, um, it, it, this, the whole deal about this anti-racist and all that, I, the Children's Defense Fund has a great goal for us to focus on. So how do we get there? And I think some of the language in here is actually going to move you away from people buying into this. Um, when it says on line 78.3, uh, communities who have been harmed and erased through schooling, that's a, we already talked about it in this committee, I think, and, and then it says on line 78.5, the chronically favor white people, you know. There's a couple audiences. I'm an audience, the audience is the audience. There's audiences out in greater Minnesota who are gonna put this on there. This is gonna become talk show stuff and not help you accomplish. So. You don't want to poke people in the eye that want to help you accomplish the goal. Everybody wants to have racial equity so that nobody can tell who's who and the outcomes are amazing and everybody succeeds. Let's just keep working for that. So I'll, I'll stop, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and being the <clears throat> research and resource kind of person that I am, I did look up that um, intellectual and academic freedom statement. Um, and it basically clarifies the right of library users to read, seek information, and speak fully, uh, freely, excuse me. So rights of library users to read, seek information, speak freely as guaranteed by the First Amendment. And so they were just asking for that statement to be um, posted and, and available to all so that they realize that education and knowledge is, um, is power and freedom, and that is the work that we do in our public libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kunish. Um, members, any other comments or questions? Just Madam uh, Chair, for the students Senator in the audience, Aisler. this is an example of a resource person using resources, <laughs> answering the question, <laughs> and this, that's amazing, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, Senator Swazinski, final comments on your bill. Yeah, I have a few comments. Um, first of all, um, Senator Coleman, thank you for those remarks you made, but a lot of the credit goes to these, these two as well. So um, I appreciate that you singled me out, but I just wanted to give due compliments to, it was a team effort um, on that um, amendment. Or t um, so thank you for that. Um, Senator Duckworth, um, two things. The teacher shortage, um, it's f probably the second most important educational issue to me right now is making sure that teachers show up when the bell rings. Cause the Senator Susinski, will you speak into your mic? I'm sorry. Wow, okay, I've never heard that before. Um, for everybody, for everybody before, online. Thank you, and before Senator I forget, um, you guys, thank you, the students out there for being here today. How a bill becomes a law 101 um, textbook example. So I just want to be happy of all the members of the committee, thank the students that were here today and the parents that um, brought them here and, or however they got here. Um, hopefully you didn't drive most of you, but, or a few of you. Anyways, um, so Senator Duckworth, I appreciate your comments about the teacher shortage. And just an FYI, I know there's a lot of comments about the F, um, ethnic studies part of of this bill, and there are, um, I would encourage all my colleagues to take a look at the, the five strands in the Soul Study Standards. A lot of the stuff that's in this bill, and that's probably going to be talked about in the future, are already embedded in those um, stand because one of the five strands is literally ethnic studies, so there's a lot of stuff that this, we're already doing in our schools, and now we're just starting to talk about it outside of education circles. Um, Senator Abler, we, we've talked about discipline 
and that's probably the number one issue for me right now is trying to figure that out so that our the kids that are that have not learned proper behavior they deserve an education and yet the students that and the teachers that maybe are, are fearful of, of some students that they can go to a safe learning environment and I think that might be our biggest task um, to, to balance the both the, those two um, um, adversarial uh, um, fill in the word that I can't find right now because it's it's I'm struggling with it greatly co colleagues on um, that particular issue so and you um, don't you come see me in my office if you ever feel like we're lowering the bar on anything, on any rigor. I, I'm all ears on that because sincerely, I, I don't want that. I, I want to make sure we have high standards for our students. And, um, and then lastly, and I wish he was here to hear what I'm about to say, so maybe one of uh, somebody on this committee or over there will, will make sure um, Senator um, um, Wiesenberg um, he, hears what I'm about to say. He attacked my character today. I, I, I took offense to that. Um, I don't really remember exactly what he said, unfortunately, but I felt it was um, an undue attack upon um, the intent of of the bill in here, and um, and I think um, and um, being that my wife is a Christian, I, I took double offense to it. And so, um, if he doesn't want to apologize to me publicly, and I don't really blame him if he doesn't want to, but I I certainly appreciate a, a private apology for the things he said about me earlier today. So, with that said, um, my colleagues, it's a joy and a pleasure to work with you. Sincerely, listening to you guys, uh, it's a treat, even if I disagree with most of the stuff you say. So thank you for that. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. Senator Swazinski renews his motion that Senate file 1311 be laid over for possible inclusion in omnibus bill. We are adjourned. <laughs>